Hello everyone, this will be our first of two lessons on describing the motion of objects or kinematics. The next one after this uh, will be on acceleration. So here I have a bunch of terms, we'll talk about these different terms and we'll get into some variable symbols, some equations, and then going ahead and doing some calculations. So first of all, scalars and vectors. Scalars refer to any variable where we have um, a number and no direction associated with that. So that's kind of the key. That's what I'll put down here is the, the big distinction is there is no direction indicated when we're talking about scalars. So a couple of examples of that uh, would be mass. Mass is not a scalar. You don't need to indicate a direction when you're given a mass of something in, say, grams or kilograms or tons. Another one will be temperature. Temperature in typically degree Celsius. Again, you don't need to give a direction. It is just what the temperature is. There's no direction, so both of those would be examples of scalars. So when we have vectors, that means that, yes, there is a direction you need to specify whether the direction is up or down, to the left, to the right, east, west, north, south. You do need to indicate the direction. And we'll see that with a few of these uh, calculations that we're doing here. So we will be talking about velocity. And velocity, you do need to indicate a direction. In which direction is the velocity taking place in? And another one in the next lesson, in fact, is acceleration. Acceleration also has a direction. So in your textbook, they do talk about position. So the position, and we'll take a look at a map in a minute here, but with position, we're really referring to um, a specific location. In your textbook, they use the symbol D for position, and this one does have a, well, typically a direction relative to a reference point, and because of that, it is a vector. Whenever something is a vector, what we do is we put this little arrow up above, and that does indicate that there is a direction associated with it. If you go to some other sources, they don't necessarily always use the D. Sometimes they just use an X for position, and they might indicate um, an initial position x1 and other positions x2 x3 and so on or for us just to be consistent with the textbook I might just use d1 d2 and so on for specific positions distance we're talking about um, well different positions and how far it is between those two positions following a specific pathway and we'll see that the symbol that we do use for distance is change in D. This one here is not a vector. Doesn't have to be a direction that is associated with it. That is different than displacement. Displacement is also delta D. Only there is the arrow over top of the D, and that means that there is a direction that is associated with this. So for distance, we might take, again, two different positions. So it might be equal to D2 minus D1. Those ones, again, they will be vectors because position is vector. This one here as well, it would be similar, D2 minus D1 and also vectors for that. We'll see though the distinction between distance and displacement is that whereas distance follows a specific path, displacement is uh, point to point as a crow flies as we like to say, the distance between two points in a straight line. Speed and velocity also um, both kind of refer to the rate, how quickly something has taken place. And in this case, it is the movement of an object. So the symbol that we do use for speed in this case is going to be a V, a lowercase v. And the symbol for velocity, which is a vector, is the same symbol V, 
with an arrow up above. I just want to go out of here for a minute and just go to the data sheet and take a look at your data sheet here and what you do have and what you don't need to remember from your data sheet. So if we take a look at some of those that we saw, uh, we saw a lowercase d and I did say that that would be for position when it does have an arrow up above. In this case they have the d for distance but then when we actually go ahead and take a look at this first equation though it is the delta d so it's the distance between two separate positions so that is our d for distance when you have again the arrow up above that means that it is a vector so displacement also the units are the same meters for both of these but displacement is a vector and distance is not a vector uh, second one that we have here the second symbol is for uh, velocity same lowercase v as with speed only now it has an arrow up above because it is a vector same units for both speed and velocity which are in meters per second and the other one that's going to be important for us in this lesson is time lowercase t for time typically measured in seconds and i'll just kind of point this out as well is the standard units that we do use are meters and seconds. So if you are given units other than meters or seconds, so for example, kilometers or hours or minutes, then you may need to convert into meters and seconds. And over to the left here, we do have this conversion table that you should also be comfortable using so you can convert from kilometers to meters and from hours to seconds. The two formula or equations that we have that we're going to talk about today are the two at the top here, which are for speed and velocity. So the only difference between them is that with velocity, we are talking about a direction associated with it. And because of that, we're not just using the change in distance, we're using displacement, which is the delta D with the arrow above the D in that equation. So let's go back to this lesson here and let's go ahead and take a look at a map of Alberta. And I'm just going to use this map here to kind of point out what these different variable symbols and names are representing. So we're going to go on a little bit of a road trip here. We're going to start in Calgary and Calgary is going to be our starting position. So kind of be consistent with the textbook. I'm just going to call Calgary our D1. That's our reference point that everything else is going to be relative to. So D1, it's going to be our initial position and it is going to be a vector. So we're going to travel from Calgary heading in a westerly direction through Canmore, Banff, Castle Junction, and to Lake Louise. So it doesn't have Lake Louise labeled on the map here, but this is Lake Louise right at this junction where when you continue further north in a northwesterly direction that is on the Icefields Parkway, that's what we're going to do. If you continue on further along this route here through Field and Golden, then you're heading into British Columbia. So this one right here, this is Lake Louise. Lake Louise and this is going to be our second position or our D2. Continuing up along the Icefields Parkway to Jasper right here, so heading up northwest, this is going to be our third position. So this is our D3, Jasper. Then we're going to head kind of north and then an easterly direction along the uh, Yellowhead Highway, Highway 16, from Jasper through Hinton, Edson, and eventually over to Edmonton, and that's going to be our D4. And then back to Calgary. So kind of going in somewhat of a, a big loop here. So we have these now four different positions. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, distance. So there is a distance following along the path traveling along the road if you start in Calgary of course it depends where exactly you start in Calgary but if you travel along the road between Calgary and Lake Louise it has a distance of about 185 kilometers 185 kilometers so this traveling along that path is our Delta D 
this one is not a vector. Even though we are traveling in a westerly direction, when we're talking about distance along the road, we're kind of changing direction all the time. We're not going in a straight line from Calgary to Lake Louise, and that is the delta D, or the change in distance. If we do the same here, going from Lake Louise to Jasper, this map is going to get a little bit messy here. So the delta D for this one is about 230 kilometers. Then if we follow along from Jasper along the Yellowhead, all the way to Edmonton, that's the longest segment of the trip, much further to get to the mountains from Edmonton than it is from Calgary. That's 365 kilometers. And then the final leg here, just about exactly 300 kilometers. So again, this is our delta D, the change in distance between Jasper and Edmonton. And this is our final delta D, the distance between Edmonton and Calgary. So we do have a grand total here of about um, 1,080 kilometers if we were to do this big loop. So what about displacement? How is displacement different than the change in distance? Let me grab a different color pen here. Well, if we do go in a straight line rather than following along the roadway here between Calgary and Jasper, I don't know if I can actually draw this as a straight line, but I'll try my best on here. So if we were to take the straight line between those two points, that is now the displacement. So this is now delta D with an arrow up above in this case. And as you can imagine, it takes much, much, much longer to travel along the roadway here, weaving in all directions to eventually make your way to Jasper. So the total distance for that is 185 plus another 230. But if you were to fly in an airplane, a straight line from one point to the other, it is only 345 kilometers. Not only is it 345 kilometers, but it is a vector. It is displacement, which means we need to give a direction. So for all of these changes in distance, they are not vectors. I don't need to give a direction. Here I do. So going from Calgary to Jasper, it is roughly in a northwest direction. And if it is a vector, you need to make sure that you are also giving a direction like that. So now that we have all of this information, this map, these different measurements, various different distances, the overall distance and the displacement that we have between Calgary and Jasper. Let's go ahead and uh, do some calculations. So if we do leave Calgary at 9 in the morning, and if we're using the 24-hour clock, sometimes it's easier to do the math using the 24-hour clock. That's uh, 0900 hours in the morning. You drive to Jasper via Lake Louise, as we did see on the map, and you arrive in Jasper at 1 p.m., which is 1,300 hours. So this is why it's a little bit easier math-wise if you know the 24-hour clock, because the change in time then is just the 13 minus the 9, which is going to give us the um, 4 hours here, which is really kind of quick if we're traveling between um, Calgary and Jasper. That's actually probably too quick. I better uh, change this a little bit here on the fly. I better change this to 2 p.m. because we can't be moving that fast. Change this to 1,400. So now we're going to make it five hours. Just so we have it a little bit a little bit more reasonable in terms of the actual time that it would take if you were to drive straight through. So what we're interested in is calculating the average speed. So let me just go out of here briefly for a minute, go back to the data sheet and show you in your data sheet what we're looking for. And it's the first equation here. So average speed between Calgary and Jasper, if we are driving straight through, is the change in distance 
divided by the change in time. There are no arrows here. There are no vectors that we're talking about here. It is just the change in distance divided by the change in time. So as we've done before with the work calculations, let's write down everything that we do have. So we want to be able to calculate the speed. That's what we're trying to find out. That's our required information. I'm going to write that down first. So again, make sure you understand there is the variable name, it is speed. There is the variable symbol. And that is the lowercase v. And then there are the variable units as well. And the units in this case are going to be kilometers per hour is the way that it's going to turn out. So this is what we are trying to find is the um, speed. Let's write that equation down. Speed is equal to the change in distance divided by the change in time. So we need distance and we need time. Well, we already know the time. We just did that change in time is equal to our five hours change in distance so we started in calgary we went from calgary to lake louise that was 185 kilometers and now we're going to jasper so we're going to add in another 230 kilometers so our total change in distance between calgary and Jasper is going to be 415 kilometers. So now we have a change in distance. We have a change in time. Now it's just a matter of plugging that into this equation here. A reminder, units. Make sure you're always giving me the units all throughout. And that includes when you plug the numbers into the equation. So in terms of grasp, this is the given information. This is the required information. This is our analysis. It is giving me the equation that you're going to use, rearranging it if you have to, but we don't in this case, and then solving it. Solving it means plugging the numbers in. So we have 415 kilometers divided by our five hours, and that works out to or if you plug the numbers into your calculator to 83 kilometers per hour so when you're traveling on the highway of course it does give a speed limit in kilometers per hour if you're traveling between calgary and the entrance to bath national park it's 110 kilometers per hour if you're traveling from that point all the way to Lake Louise and up to Jasper, it's only 90 kilometers per hour. And sometimes around Lake Louise, it's as low as 70 kilometers per hour. So that's why overall, this seems quite reasonable that it would work out to about 83 kilometers per hour. And this is significant. Always ask yourself the question, does it kind of make sense to be traveling at this speed? And in this case, yes, it does make perfect sense. So what's the difference between speed and velocity? Well, a direction. There is a direction. And now we're talking about the point-to-point -point distance, not along a specific route. So if we go back to that map, with the map driving between Calgary and Jasper, we had to follow all along this, well, the Trans-Canada Highway, and then Highway 93, the Icefields Parkway, and you're kind of changing direction all the time and weaving around and that's why it's the 415 kilometers but then i have the red line here so the red line is for displacement and when you're calculating velocity it involves displacement rather than the distance so we're going to do something well very similar here i'm going to write down what we're trying to calculate first of all and that is our velocity and we're going to have to have a direction because it is a vector and vectors do have a direction. What we do know is the change in time. Well, we're going to keep it the same. We're still driving along that same route. It's still taking us the five hours. But now we're using a different number to calculate the velocity. We're using the displacement. And the displacement was only 345 
kilometers. So our equation directly from your data sheet is the change in or the displacement now divided by the change in time as we did before. Now we have 345 kilometers and we're dividing it by the same five hours. So plug these numbers into your calculator and it works out to what does it work out to here? Six nine kilometers per hour. I just need to plug that in here, you guys. So 69 kilometers per hour for that one there. And again, because that one is a velocity, we now need a direction associated with it as well. So if we do go back to our map here, again, we can sort of see that it's kind of in a northwesterly direction. So we would also have to indicate that. So 69 kilometers per hour northwest, and that would be our velocity. So now let's go on to the next layer of our journey, going from Jasper to Edmonton. And here we're told that there is an average speed of a reasonable 105 kilometers an hour. And we're going to calculate how long. So what we want is a time that it will take for this trip. So our information that we're given then, we're given the speed, 105 kilometers per hour. We're traveling and we want the distance. Because it's speed, we want the distance, not the displacement. So if we go back again and take a look at that number that I had on the map, going from Jasper to Edmonton, it was 365 kilometers, this number right here, 365. And what we're asked to calculate is the change in time. How long does that actually take? So our equation is the same as the first one that we used here for speed. Speed is equal to the change in distance divided by the change in time. But we need to rearrange this equation because we want to solve in this case for not the speed, we already have that. What we want in our case is the change in time. So we want to get change in time on its own on the other side of the arrow. So I've showed you some different strategies for how, are we, how to rearrange these. I'm just going to put the speed over one. So if I do have change in time in the denominator on the right hand side, if I want to move it to the left hand side, it goes to the top. If it's in the denominator, it goes to the numerator. It's going to go up here. Speed it is in the numerator on the left-hand side. If I move it to the right-hand side of the equal sign, it goes in the denominator. So really all I'm going to do is I'm going to flip around my time and my speed. So this is my rearranged equation that we do have here. The change in time, which is what we're asked to calculate, is going to be the change in distance divided by the speed. So that is the 300 and uh, 65 kilometers. Is that what we had? 365 kilometers divided by our speed, 105 kilometers per hour. 
kilometers cancel out and we are going to be left with hours. So I need to go ahead and plug this into my calculator myself. And that equals 3.48 hours for this portion of the trip. All right, I just wanted to go back and take a look at the numbers that I had here. So now we're going to calculate the velocity for the entire trip. Well, this is actually kind of a trick question. So velocity, of course, is the displacement divided by the change in time. But if we started in Calgary and we end up back in Calgary, our displacement is actually zero. Zero divided by, well, it might be 10 hours that it takes, but we haven't traveled any in terms of the displacement. So our displacement is zero in that particular case. If we calculate the velocity from Calgary to Vancouver, the shortest distance by road is about 1,180 kilometers. Displacement is about 700 kilometers, and the trip will take about 13 hours on average. So here, you are asked to calculate velocity. So going from Calgary to Lake Louise to Jasper to Edmonton and back to Calgary, your velocity is zero. As strange as that seems. That's not your speed, but that is your velocity. If you go from Calgary to Vancouver, you do end up in a different place, so there will be, in fact, a number for the velocity. So let's do this one more time. Velocity is equal to your displacement. Now this is where you need to be careful. Which number are you going to pick here? So because we are talking about velocity, because velocity is vector, you need to make sure that you use the displacement. You're using the 700 kilometers for this calculation and not the 1180. So we're going to take our 700 kilometers. We're going to divide it by the 13 hours that it takes for this trip. And we'll plug this number in here. And that seems like kind of a, a low number of about 53 kilometers an hour. I'll put it in as 53.85 kilometers an hour. And then we'll take a look at our significant digits here. So this might be an exact number, the 13 hours, it may not. So it might vary depending upon whether we're going to use two or three significant digits. And again, when you have a number like 700, it's, uh, it's kind of ambiguous, debatable as to whether you count these two zeros here as being significant digits. This is just a round sort of figure, the 700. It's probably not exact. Same with the 13 hours that we have here. So we could probably be safe and just kind of round this to about 54 kilometers per hour. So I did mention that the standard units are meters and seconds. So let's say that we do have this velocity here. Oh, and we need a direction as well, right? Because it is a vector. So this direction is roughly a westerly direction that you would be traveling in. If we want to convert this into meters per second, how do we go ahead and, and do that? Well, let's write down our 54 kilometers per hour. 
and kind of go through step by step using what's called uh, unit conversions or dimensional analysis. So first of all, let's kind of focus on the kilometers and let's get rid of the kilometers and convert it into meters. So to get rid of this at the top, I need to multiply it by something that has kilometers in the bottom so they can cancel out. In one kilometer, how many meters do we have? Well, it's 1,000. If you're not sure about that, then you go to the conversion table on your data sheet. So 1,000 meters in one kilometer, the kilometers cancel out because they're in the numerator and the denominator, and now I've converted the kilometers into meters, and now I would have meters per hour. So now I need to work on the hours. How do I get rid of the hours? Hours is in the denominator, so I want to put it in the numerator. So in one hour, how many minutes do we have? 60 minutes in one hour. Hours cancel out because they're in the denominator in the numerator and now we will have a number that is in meters per minute but I want to go right to seconds so I want to cancel out minutes so I'm going to put minutes up above in one minute we have 60 seconds so through this chain here you're going to take 54 and you're going to times that 54 by a thousand and then you're going to divide it by 60 and then you're going to divide it by 60 again. Or, if you can remember this, this is kind of useful, there are 3,600 seconds per one single hour. And that gives us 15 <laughs> meters per second for our final answer. We'll finally just take a look at a couple of graphs here. This first graph here is showing distance, or really, it is kind of displacement, it looks like, and time at the bottom. So these graphs here, when we're plotting uh, distance or displacement in time, time always, always, always does go on the x-axis. Time is on the x-axis, and it looks like here, they don't give the units, they should always give the units, but the time, of course, according to this, is going to be in hours. The distance, in this case, is going to be in kilometers. So probably a car that we're talking about, the movement of a car, and what it's saying that a car is starting at its initial position. So zero would be the initial position. It doesn't have to be. It could start anywhere up along here. In this case, it is starting at the origin, and then it's starting to move. And what it's showing is for the next two hours, its distance is changing, and after two hours, it has traveled 30 kilometers. It took two hours from 9 a.m. until 11, and over that two-hour period, it covered a distance of 30 kilometers. So then it also says with this gray line that this is the speed, the gradient, or the slope. So if you calculate the slope, of a distance time graph, that does give you the speed. So how do you calculate the slope? Well, slope is equal to rise over run. Slope equal to rise over run. So our rise in this case is going to be the 30 meters, or sorry, kilometers, and our run from here to here is going to be two hours. So if you go 30 divided by two, then we have 15 kilometers per hour is going to be the speed. How do we calculate that? We took the slope of a distance time graph. What's happening during the next segment here where it's flat? Well, now the distance isn't changing, so the person has actually stopped. There is no movement. So they stop between 11 and 12. They're not moving at all, and then they start to move again. So if we take a look at this green slope, notice that it is steeper, and what that means is that it's going faster. So we could go ahead and do the same thing. We could do the rise over run. We could calculate the slope again equals rise over run. 
So notice that the rise here is not all the way from the bottom, it's from this point. So here we're going from 30 to 60, or we would go 60 kilometers minus 30 kilometers. And then we would do the same for the x-axis. So here it is 12, 30, 30 minutes is what it looks like, or half an hour. So I'll put this as hour, 0 0.5 hours. So now we're going 30 kilometers divided by 0 0.5 hours. So that's going to equal 60 kilometers per hour. So of course, that's faster. It's a steeper curve, so it is faster. And then this last little bit of a line here, they're uh, going back to the starting point. So if we were talking about displacement, the actual displacement would end up being zero once it reaches back at this point here. And the velocity would be zero. But here we're not talking about velocity and displacement. We're talking about distance and speed. So we could go ahead and we could calculate the actual speed for this one here as well as they're returning to the starting point. And the last graph that I have here is a velocity time graph. Again, time always, always, always on the x-axis. Here it's in units of seconds and velocity is in meters per second. So what is going on here? So from time zero over the next four seconds, the velocity is getting higher and higher and higher. So think of this as a car that's maybe oh, starting from a red light. The red light turns to green and now it's going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And then maybe it reaches the speed limit. So then it continues at a constant speed once it has reached that speed limit. And then it reaches another sign which says you can go faster. So he picks up speed and the car is going faster and faster and faster and faster. So with a velocity time graph, wherever you see a line that's going up like this, then the vehicle is going faster and faster, which is what we call acceleration. Whenever it's going back down, it's slowing down or deceleration. Whenever you see a flat line, then it's um, still moving, but it's not going faster or going slower. It's traveling at a constant speed.